All right, thank you so much for joining us tonight, everybody. We hope that you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy in the middle of what we know is a really challenging time for our country. Um, we're so glad that you're here and that you're spending this time with us. I think this will serve as a good dose of hope and inspiration. Uh, my name is Kate Catherall, and I am a co-founder of ARENA. I spent the last three years leading our work with campaigns and campaign staff. And so it's really special for me to be back with you here tonight as your MC for this call. Um, as you know, we have a very special guest, Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton will be joining us later on. But first, we have a really great program for you. Uh, you're gonna hear from uh, my two co-founders and uh, one of the best strategists in the business. So I have the great pleasure of introducing them now. Um, the first uh, person you'll hear from is Swathi Mailavarapu. She is the board chair and co-founder of ARENA. She is also the founder of Insight.org and very recently served as Mayor Pete's national investment chair. She is one of the most people-focused, generous leaders I know. Super excited for you to hear from her tonight. You'll also hear from our co-founder, Ravi Gupta, who is the managing partner of ARENA, leading our work as we sprint toward the election in 2020. Uh, Ravi has a really diverse background of experience that he brings to bear. Uh, prior to ARENA, he was running a network of schools in the South. He also served as a special assistant and speechwriter to Susan Rice and uh, was on the 2008 Obama campaign. And he's got uh, lots of great stuff to share with you about the work that the team is doing um, headed into this cycle. And finally, moderating that conversation, you'll hear from one of the very best strategists in democratic politics, Adisi Demisi. Uh, he also happens to be one of uh, the very kindest and most thoughtful leaders I've had the pleasure of working with. We first met back on Cory Booker's 2013 campaign for Senate. Adisu has since gone on to manage many more campaigns, including Gavin Newsom's campaign for uh, governor of California, and most recently, uh, Senator Booker's campaign for president of the United States. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Adisu, who will moderate this conversation. Thank you, Kate. Uh, it's good to see you. It's good to see you, Swati, and the birthday boy. We haven't said it yet, but it is Ravi Gupta's birthday. I'm not going to say the year. I'll let you uh, <laughs> say it proudly. We get around to you, but it's good to be with you guys virtually here from California. I hope uh, for all of you who are watching out there, I hope you're healthy of mind and body and finding ways to stay connected with your community uh, in this time. And thanks to the arena for having me. Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, as, as Kate referenced, I worked, uh, I've worked in politics for a long time. I had the pleasure for uh, of working for Secretary Clinton twice uh, in her, both of her runs for president in 20, 2008 and 2016. And after the loss in 2016, I was heartbroken, like I'm guessing a lot of you were. Took a little bit of a sabbatical, came, uh, left the country, came back in March, actually. And um, Ravi sent me an email and said, come to North Carolina. We're having this little thing called uh, our second, I think at that point, arena uh, summit get together. And I said, sure. It was really my first sort of foray back into politics after the 2016 election. And when I got to Raleigh, I was so inspired, not just by, uh, you know, the, the, the people that were there, not just by what Ravi had done by putting something like that together in three months, but, um, but all the people that were there would be candidates, staffers, uh, the energy just like brought me back to life in a way that brought me back to campaigns. I ended up going to run Gavin's campaign and then Corey's campaign after that. And so I've just been a huge fan of the arena ever, ever really since then, a huge fan of Ravi's for a long time, got to know Swati, I've known Kate and a lot of the other folks around it. And I just, uh, I was lucky enough to hire some arena alumni for the Booker campaign and other campaigns. And I'm just really proud to be a part of this organization and a part of, of this uh, here tonight. We need organizations like this uh, now more than ever. And so, with that, I'm gonna moderate a little conversation uh, between uh, the three of us about politics in this moment and, uh, and the future of the progressive movement. I'm gonna start, actually I'll start with you Swati with a really simple question, which is what inspired you to get involved like this and start ARENA in the first place? Thanks Adisi, and I have to tell you, I can feel my blood pressure dropping in the first five minutes of this call. It is really wonderful to be back in this special community of people of amazing leaders who are civic-minded and public service oriented and it feels like the perfect antidote this evening to turning on the news which is what i'd probably otherwise be doing um so it's good to take this little trip down memory lane because you were talking about november of 2016 and sort of your reaction to the election outcome um and you know for me the genesis story of arena really starts at the same time the 
day after the election, I was super upset, like so many of us, and um, didn't consider myself to be a super active participant in the political ecosystem. I voted, I cared a lot, I read the news, but I wasn't ever thinking about running for office and didn't know much about it. But I spent a couple of days just reading everything that I could and talking to folks um, that were out there doing work and realized a couple of things actually that really caught my attention. One, at that point in 2016, Democrats were like a few thousand, we held something like a few thousand fewer seats around the country than we had in 2008. So I thought it was really interesting and problematic that we had kind of fallen out of the practice of running for lots of different kinds of offices all across the country. Um, I was also really distraught by the direction that it seemed like the incoming administration was going to take the country, and we've seen how that's played out in the last couple of years. But I also had spent my career up until that point building tech companies, and I couldn't help but see the comparisons. In some ways, it seemed a lot easier and more straightforward to learn how to start a company, which I have to tell you is not an easy thing, than it was to figure out how to run for office, which is like a fundamental principle of our democracy. So, you know, as sometimes happens serendipitously, I had an email in my inbox that week from one Ravi Gupta, who Ravi and I had known each other from being Truman scholars way back before then. And Ravi kind of created a perfect invitation. He was like, look, if you're thinking like I am, like this is a call to action and that we need to get more folks running for office and figure out how to make this more accessible, come together, let's meet in Nashville a month from, from the election. Uh, and that was the very first summit. And the, you know, the arena has kind of taken on a life of its own. Sometimes with good ideas, you know that they're great ideas also because of the caliber of people that, that the idea attracts. And you know, this community had amazing people like Kate and you and Lauren Underwood and Andy Kim and Haley Stevens and Dan McCready, people that were coming for these convenings, and um, it just kind of took on a life of its own since then. Yeah, and Ravi, uh, you do deserve a lot of the credit here. I'm just curious, what, how is how has the idea of Arena evolved over the course of now, I guess, almost four years, and and particularly in this now COVID-19 pandemic world? What is, uh, you know, how are you looking differently at the programs and the the, the type of uh, work that that Arena is doing? Yeah, and I think I will start with a shout out to Kate, who uh, in the beginning uh, conceived of our candidate support work. You know, when we when we first started out, we started as a convening organization and then quickly shift focus after meeting so many inspiring first time candidates in 2018. And she really designed a program that helped us uh, elect people like Lauren Underwood and people like Andy Kim and people like Max Rose all around the country, like that next generation of candidates. Uh, and one thing that we're learning in this uh, really uncertain time is that uh, campaigns uh, have been really paralyzed uh, right now during the initial few weeks of uh, social isolation because a lot of what they're told, which is, uh, you know, get out there, knock doors, um, you know, especially when we talk about the more local campaigns, um, you know, meet as many people as possible, hold fundraising events, a lot of what they're told they cannot do. Uh, and so uh, what we quickly did was um, identify a few uh, key moves and considerations for campaigns that we think are going to make a huge difference. And uh, number one is uh, in states where, and, and most of the states that we operate in, uh, vote by mail is an option in some form. Uh, number one is just getting ready for vote by mail and, 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 and just dominating uh, the organizing around that, uh, making sure that you're ready to go and that you're ready for the calendar of vote by mail. And, and I've identified every voter you need uh, to request a ballot where necessary and they submit it uh, early. Uh, second is helping people with their budgets and shout out to Abby who's on our team, uh, Abby Witt who uh, is a seasoned uh, campaign manager who's been working with campaigns uh, around the country to help them shift their budgets from uh, this in-person door knocking field over the summer which we can't, we can't uh, assume we're going to be able to do uh, to more digital uh, operations and digital advertising. Um, and then third is, is helping campaigns. This seems like a really basic thing, but a lot of candidates think they're not allowed to fundraise right now. And one thing we're doing is coaching them through the ethics of fundraising at this time and saying, look, uh, you have to, you've signed up for uh, a civic duty and uh, your duty is to win because you believe you're going to be a better leader than your opponent. And part of winning requires you to build capacity for a campaign. 
And so it's okay to ask people for money. Now there are ways to do it. You need to call people up and make sure they're okay and that they're, uh, they haven't lost their jobs and you shouldn't be asking money from people who are distressed in this time. But once you know that somebody is okay, you absolutely need to be asking them for money and you should be spending a significant amount of your time doing that right now because there's not much else you can do sitting at home. Um, and then there's like the, all, everything around managing a remote team, which is not easy for anybody, especially for campaigns, which are largely startup operations. And then I'll just talk about a couple other quick things we're doing. We shifted, our, we do these academies. We trained over a thousand people last year. Uh, and another shout out to Kate who really helped us build that program. Uh, and we were supposed to do two in-person academies, one last month and one uh, next week, one in North Carolina and then one in Florida. Uh, and we've shifted those completely online and we'll have trained an additional 300 people online to work on campaigns. Uh, and a second thing we're doing is we're expanding our online uh, toolbox and shout out to Santiago Martinez on our team who's been building out these virtual tools that campaigns can use uh, at home, just in time, whatever they need from building a budget to building a field plan, et cetera. Uh, and then the final thing we're doing is we have this program called Arena Careers, which if people are at home and they haven't joined it yet, uh, Arena Careers is uh, basically like a LinkedIn for politics. And, and it's our way of saying, uh, if you're looking for work or you're looking for employees, uh, we're making that whole process a lot more efficient. So you can have a one-stop shop to do that. It's free for everybody involved. And so we've expanded that work and, and put that work in front of more people. So there's just a few things that we're doing uh, to adapt to this yeah. uncertain time. Um, but more importantly, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to, to send it back to you, Adisu. Uh, you're one of the more experienced campaign managers we have in the party. Uh, what would you tell campaign managers and candidates right now about what to do uh, at this time? Yeah, it's, it's tough. Uh, you know, you referenced uh, a lot of it is, is, I think, first of all, it depends on the level at which you're running, you know, federal, state, local. Um, I think a lot of folks listening to this are, are probably at the state and local level, but, um, but it really depends on that. It depends on if you're taking on an incumbent versus running in an open seat race, if you're in a primary versus, you know, have no primary at all. But a couple things that come to mind um, first, and you kind of referenced this, is I would focus on um, what we call grass tops outreach more than grassroots at this point, not because grassroots isn't super important, but because I think most voters aren't thinking about electoral politics right now. They're thinking about keeping their job, feeding their family, keeping healthy. Um, and there's going to be plenty of time, we hope, in the summer and fall, whether that's digitally or um, or in person, hopefully, to do more grassroots voter contact. So really focusing on grass tops, folks. That means donors. That means leaders of organizations. Um, seeking endorsements, th that kind of thing. People who are, who sort of do politics a little more um, uh, regularly or semi-professionally or even professionally, as it were, those folks are ready to have those conversations uh, now in this moment and frankly, probably eager to do so. People like me who are sitting at home with nothing else to do. Um, so that's kind of behind the scenes. I think in public, I think the biggest thing really is like be, a, be aggressive about being out there, uh, particularly if you're taking on an incumbent. Um, you know, it has the... It does feel a little strange, you kind of talked about this, talking about politics right now and electoral politics, but if you're in the arena, if, you're, if, you, if you put yourself on a ballot, uh, you've done it for a reason. Like you said, Ravi, you're, you're, you think you'd be the best person to represent your community, and this is an opportunity to show, not tell that in the midst of a crisis, and, and it has the sort of triple effect of, of driving your name recognition up, driving the conversation in the direction you want to, and if you're taking on an incumbent, um, putting, you know, holding them accountable and hopefully producing some better governmental outcomes. So, you know, it's hard to drive news in your own, uh, in any, anything that's not coronavirus related right now, but if you can be aggressive, get out there, react to current events and put your, uh, your name out there forward and put your opponent potentially on the defensive, I think that's a worthwhile location strategy, at least in this moment. Um, I have some other thoughts, but those are the first ones that come to mind. It's, it's a really tough moment. Actually, let me say one more quick thing, which is prepare for the post world. Not that there's gonna be a post pandemic world, but um, someday we are gonna hopefully talk about, you know, a lot of the issues that face all of our communities. And this is an opportunity to regroup, make sure you have a vision for what the new normal is gonna look like. So um, that's a lot of internal work for candidates in particular and managers um, to learn and think about what that world is gonna look like in the summer and fall, talk to experts and. Uh, and make sure you're ready for that moment. So a couple things to think about is, as you, if you're a manager or a candidate, uh, might want to do out there. Um, I talked a little bit about the various levels. I know that um, Arena has really focused a lot on 
uh, on state and local and state, uh, the state level in particular. And I wanted to ask Swati again if she thought about this back in 2016, 17, and over the course of the last uh, few years, why target state legislatures? Why target, uh, you know, down the ballot uh, for ARENA and, and, and make that a core part of the program that you're running? So something that I think is really unique about ARENA among, even across the progressive, this amazing and much more diverse progressive ecosystem that's evolved since 2016 is, this is an organization that I think is really nimble and pivots to what the need is cycle over cycle. So rather than just focus on candidate recruitment, for example, which is what we did a lot of in 2017 and 2018, we then realized and diagnosed, okay, one of the other challenges to getting more great candidates to run is ensuring that they have high caliber staff. So the focus in 2019 and 2020 has been training a new generation of staff to go in and actually help these candidates organize power. And then so too, we've, we've realized in the process, okay, it's not just House and Senate races um, and, you know, the, that sort of quintessential stereotypical Democratic saying of that, that Democrats tend to treat the presidency like it's the only office that matters. It's also state office where there's so much opportunity and also candidly in recent history has been some underinvestment. We have really ceded a lot of ground as progressives, as Democrats on our values in these state legislative races. And at the same time, those state ledge races are oftentimes the ones that arbiter a lot of the issues and policy implications that affect our day-to-day -day lives. So if you care deeply about reproductive rights, gun control, these huge issues of legislative redistricting, the linchpin of influence there hinges on how these state legislative races go. Um, so that's kind of the rationale for why we've really focused there. Um, we're partnering with an organization this cycle called Future Now. Um, and alongside Future Now Fund are doing a few things. We're making a major financial investment. So we're putting $7 million in resourcing into these state legislative races. We're focused on five states in particular, Arizona, Florida, Michigan, Texas, and North Carolina. And we chose those states in particular because those are five states where the Republican majority in the state ledge is really paper thin, but the policy stakes and the redistricting stakes are disproportionately high. So it means that in most cases, the effort, the program that we're running this year is really focused on flipping a handful of seats in each of those chambers to make sure that we're able to fix Republican-made state crises like racial gerrymandering and restrictions on Medicaid, or frankly, right now, some of the coronavirus responses that we're seeing at the state level in those places. Um, Ravi's gonna go into this in a little bit more detail, but I'm sure folks are wondering, well, what does it mean for ARENA and Future Now to be focused on state legislative races? And you know, this is something I really like to emphasize. We get really hands-on and try to be thought partners and action partners to candidates and their campaigns. So what that means for the state led races that we're taking on in these five states, Adisu, is that we'll be providing financial and strategic support to make sure that candidates and their teams are able to build the top-notch campaigns that they want to and aren't super resource constrained. Uh, Arena is going to commit to training 150 staffers in each of these states. And in fact, we've actually already conducted the training for North Carolina um, uh, and have Florida coming up soon. We're also going to fund and help place 100 priority staff on a subset of these state races. Um, and we'll commit to fully funding the highest impact additional tactics, including digital ads, um, which will be really important this cycle, given everything that's going on with the pandemic, to make sure that we're helping these state legislative candidates and their campaigns target people where they are. So over SMS, um, over their, their apps, their phones, um, and also help them use evidence-based voter turnout methods, which we know are going to be, again, particularly important this cycle. Yeah, and I just want to shout out, will you uh, mention the five states again, just so everybody writes them down, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Take a picture if you're in one of those states, get involved. Totally, so it's Arizona, uh, Florida, Michigan, Texas, and North Carolina. Yeah, and I, I was lucky enough to be a part of the North Carolina Academy a couple weeks ago, I guess now. Uh, the first one that was done virtually, it was great. Um, and as somebody, 
Kate talked a lot about my experience doing national campaigns and statewide campaigns, but my first love was doing local stuff here in California, uh, state ledge, mayor's races, and you name it. And I cannot say how valuable it is to have a resource like this when you're a understaffed or so, in some cases non-staffed <laughs> race to, 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 to that. exactly. You can just, it turns, it literally can double, triple, or infinity times your capacity to, to run a good campaign. So it's really, oh, really totally. Cool. I mean, I, you know, the, I think sometimes it's easy to forget the scale or the magnitude of these things. I mean, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, when, when I was helping Pete with that presidential campaign, we raised and practically spent more than a hundred million dollars on that one race for one office. And some of these state legislative races that arena is looking at this cycle, I mean, we're talking about entire campaign budgets that are in the tens of thousands of dollars. So, you know, the, the opportunity for impact for a single person volunteering or a single dollar that's donated to one of those campaigns and candidates is really tremendous which is also, frankly, good news because we have so many of these seats and races that we need to win this cycle. Yeah, amen. And I think it's one of the best things, obviously, to come out of the, uh, the 2016 uh, uh, sadness is that there's been a renewed focus on the entire Democratic ticket, uh, top to bottom. Obviously, we have to win back uh, the presidency, which I'll talk about here with Robbie in a second, but we can't forget that we're building a bench and, and doing good policy work at the local and state level. So I'm very- Oh, I mean, I'm sure you had some of these um, moments in, in your North Carolina training, but I mean, I'm like, it gives me so much hope, Adisu. There are candidates that are getting on the ballot and running in deeply red parts of some of these states that frankly, they're getting out and having a conversation with voters that, the, that those, those voters haven't had in years or decades in some cases. And, um, you know, we want to win each and every one of those campaigns, absolutely. That's why we take so many of these shots on goal. But there's also just, I mean, you know this as a campaign manager, there's also just value in having that conversation because even if you don't get all the way there this cycle, you make it that much easier for somebody else to get out there and take it all the way next cycle. Totally right, totally right. Well, Ravi, I'm gonna talk about the elephant in the room, which is the presidential. <laughs> we talked about the down ballot. Uh, and obviously, I think a lot of the folks on this call, myself included, are a little obsessed with what happens in November at the top of the ticket. How do we balance the understandable focus on, on the presidential race this cycle with um, playing the long game for not just the down ballot this cycle, but 22, 24 and beyond? And how is Arena thinking about the next cycle and the cycle after that and making sure it's built for the long run? Yeah, well, I think you and I are both long-suffering uh, sports fans, and I think, you know, you're a, a Falcons fan, I'm a Bills fan, and we've both been victims of the New England Patriots. <laughs> and I think for those of us, for those of you who follow the Patriots, I think most people are generally aware that they're a very successful franchise. Uh, I think often the, the Republican Party is like the Patriots in the sense that they, they build systems so that they win in the short term way more often than they should, uh, and then they build enduring systems that last from season to season and build upon each other. And I think, uh, and we as Democrats are kind of like the, the Jets, like every, every year, every cycle, we, we build up and tear down new infrastructure. We fire our coach, we get mad at each other, we get despondent, then we get complacent if we do better than we should. Uh, and so I think what we need to do is connect the short and the long term and build critical infrastructure that uh, is both going to help us win right now uh, and that's going to live beyond the cycle. And we need to build, uh, you know, somebody once said of Bill Belichick, the coach of the Patriots, if he were a house builder, he'd build one really solid brick house. Uh, and I think when I think about the work that Arena is doing, I try to like picture uh, that we're, we're going brick by brick. We want every piece of the infrastructure that we build to be very solid and enduring. We use the word enduring all the time. And so a great example is the work that we're doing with Academy uh, and how that connects to the careers work that we're doing. So, uh, you know, one way we could do it is just do online trainings, people come and go, uh, and they go in a spreadsheet somewhere. But the reason why we do careers and why we've brought in members of our team, like Heather, who's on our team, and shout out to her, uh, who spends all of her time talking to our graduates, asking them where they are, uh, collecting data on where they are, asking employers how our people are doing, uh, and then keeping track of when people come off of campaigns and then getting them back into the work is because we need that cycle to perpetuate itself so that we can keep people in the work, keep track of data, what's working and what's not, 
uh, so that we can reactivate people from cycle to cycle and collect best practices and just professionalize the work of campaigns. And so I don't think of it as a choice uh, between the short and the long term. I think that one can uh, feed the other. Um, one thing I did want to throw back to you because we're getting a lot of requests about this, uh, Adisu, and you touched on this a little bit, but I'd love for you to go deeper, is uh, vote by mail. Uh, you have built a lot of field systems over the years. Uh, and, you know, I remember we, <laughs> we were in the boiler room in, uh, in Ohio in 2008 when Obama won. Uh, and that was, you know, one of the most sophisticated uh, get out the vote operations that you ran in that state uh, that people have ever seen. And you've gone on to, to do it at a national level. What would you be telling folks, like, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, from the state director for a presidential down to a legislative race in the same state? What should people be thinking about in terms of winning vote by mail, like dominating that process? Uh, yeah, I think, and you were talking about it earlier, I think it's going to be, regardless of whether we, things are a little more back to normal or as they are right now, it's going to be an important part of our get out the vote strategy in November and October, I should say. And so we got to start thinking about it now. You know, number one is understanding the rules of your state, um, wherever you are. We basically have 50 different systems in this country and some states like Oregon, you get a ballot mailed to you regardless. And all you got to do is basically go chase any voter as if they were the same. Some states, you have to have an excuse still to vote absentee, although folks are trying to advocate to change that uh, in this pandemic world. But understanding the rules of your state, I think is really, really important. Um, and it's actually really important to know the rules have changed even since 2016. Uh, I was talking with some of my fellow Clinton campaign alums from 2016 and Pennsylvania in 16 was uh, basically an all election day state. I think something like 98, 99% of folks voted on election day, but Pennsylvania has instituted uh, mail-in voting since I believe it was in 20, it was last year in 2019. And so this cycle will be the first time in Pennsylvania and a few other states where you have voters who can vote by mail. And so making sure that, that A, you understand the rules and B, you understand that the voters are learning the rules in some places at the same time that you are, there has to be a big public education element to it. I think the other piece is just uh, doing what I referenced earlier, GOTV, get out the vote, is a month long process. It is not one day in November. It is from the day your voting starts here in California, it's four weeks before election day through election day. And that means you have to build systems and campaigns and voter contacts to adapt to that system. And so in a lot of states uh, or in a lot of campaigns before you might, you know, concentrate a lot of your voter contact, whether that be paid or otherwise in the last week. Uh, but that's just not going to fly anymore. You're going to have to start a little bit earlier. You're going to have to spread your resources out a little bit more over the course of the entire last few weeks or month or whatever it is in which voting is going to be happening. Understanding the trends in your state of how vote by mail tends to get submitted and just, uh, and just making sure that you have a plan for not just election day. Election day is important, maybe the most important day, but it's one election day over the course of many. And last but not least is advocate now. There are some states, I said before, that still don't allow vote by mail, but there's a growing movement now in the pandemic world to, to change that uh, in those states that have restrictive laws. And if you as a candidate, frankly, can get on the front end of that, it can help you A, make some news, but also do good by your voters and by your future constituents. So, um, and that time frame is shrinking really here now. Uh, we have to do something basically in May or else it's gonna be too late to implement it for, for, uh, for this November, but it's, there's still time. Um, I think we want to do some Q&A, but I want to ask one more question of, I guess, both of you guys uh, to end us on a happy note here. Uh, what gives you hope right now, Swati, about arena, about politics, about the progressive movement, um, and where we're going even in this difficult time? I mean, watching the amazing leaders that are coming out of this movement and watching us win it's not always every single race that we take on in a given cycle, but I think at this point now over three and a half, almost four years, there's quite a bit of that um, to be seen. And what's remarkable to me is this is a, a category, a new kind of cohort of leaders, whether the candidates themselves or the folks that are building these campaigns, they are intrepid. They are values driven. They lead with their values more than they do partisan politics. They're changing the language and I think the focus um, of how we get work done as as a larger party and they're diverse and they're not you know they understand diversity and inclusion as a design criteria not 
as a talking point. You know, they tend to have teams that offer a tremendous amount of gender and um, socioeconomic and racial and sexual orientation uh, diversity all baked in because they know that it's important and that it's their job to work towards representing all of our country. So all of that gives me so much hope. I'm with you. Ravi? Yeah, I think, you know, what gives me hope is that this is completely in our hands. Uh, I think it, you know, people often talk about this race like it's uh, subject to, you know, the external factors only. And although obviously external factors matter, uh, one thing that prompted us to start ARENA in the first place is uh, some of us, and I put myself in this category for sure, didn't do enough last time. And I think uh, if everybody does uh, the maximum they possibly can between now and the election to help win this thing, uh, or even just 20% more than they did last time, um, we'll be in really good shape because I think the reason why they got us last time is because uh, too many people uh, stood on the sidelines and took for granted that we were going to win that thing. And so I'm hopeful that enough people realize that. And I think that we've got the numbers behind us. And as long as we stay disciplined and we win the game of inches, I'm confident we're going to come out and top, not just in the presidency uh, in November, but down ballot and set ourselves up for a decade plus to come. Couldn't agree more. Well, there have been some questions, I think, submitted for us. We have our special guest joining, I think, in a couple minutes. But let's, Lee, I'm going to kick it to you. Fire away with any questions we got as much as possible. Awesome. Let's do it. Uh, first question is from Lila from Des Moines, Iowa. And Swathi, I'm going to kick this one to you. Uh, what is Arena's budget and how much have we raised so far? Yep, it's an important question. Uh, so the overall budget for this year is $5 million. We've raised just over $2 million of it, which leaves another $3 million left to raise. And those are all of the funds to focus on these five state legislatures that we're working hard to help flip and the Arena Careers matching program, um, as well as the toolbox, which is becoming more and more important. So that's our online resource for uh, kind of digital resources for anybody that's running a campaign anywhere. Awesome. Uh, next question comes from Corinne. Uh, Adisu, I'm going to kick this one to you. How do you effectively campaign during COVID-19? I think it's really hard to make personal connections on the phone, texting, and on Zoom. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, I think we're all learning at the same time, to be honest with you. I, I wish I could tell you the answer to this question, but we, none of us have ever gone through this. I think from the Biden campaign to your, you know, city council race, we're all trying to figure out both strategically and tactically, like what works. I actually do think, though, that, like I said before, a couple things. One is separate sort of your grass tops politics from your grassroots politics, different tactics, totally different audiences, different things you got to do. And I do think at the grass tops level, just your basic telephone calls still work, you know, it, 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 and frankly, people are more receptive to them now than they might otherwise be. At the grassroots level, I think you got to be a little bit more creative, uh, obviously using the internet. Uh, I've seen candidates here in Oakland uh, for city council doing events, you know, outside of their house where it's sort of old fashioned, uh, just in their neighborhood, obviously, for their neighbors, old fashioned stumping like Taft did in his campaigns back in the early 1900s. Uh, but we got to be creative about it. I, I really wish I had the answer. My only, my only real thought here is, the internet is going to be critical, digital communications are going to be critical, and leveraging existing networks through relational organizing, um, people's social media networks is going to be critical because folks are really only largely talking to people they know right now and not strangers for obvious reasons. And so we have to tap into networks as they exist. And you as a candidate or as a campaign manager need to figure out how to do that with your core volunteers and supporters. Awesome. Um, next question comes to us from Eric from Denver, Colorado. Eric said, I'm interested in running for local office in Denver. It's something I've thought a lot about um, as I figure out how to tell my own story. What strategies and tactics made Cory Booker and Gavin Newsom successful in communicating their life stories to inspire political action? How were they able to remain authentic in the face of competitive campaigns? I guess that's a question for me. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know, it's a good question. Like, I think what, one thing that campaign being in campaigns has taught me in general is that an electoral campaign specifically is that voters are looking for we're, voters are looking to elect people not a series of policy considerations to office <laughs> you elect human beings uh not platforms not that platforms aren't important but you're a person first and foremost and so that means telling your personal story and 
Um, you know, I'm not going to go through a whole Marshall Gans public narrative training here, but you need to tell the story, <laughs> this, your story of self first, which is, you know, why you're called to what you're doing. Um, and I think Corey in particular, Gavin as well, have done a really good job of doing that. And that draws people in and allows people to, um, oh, look what we got. It allows people to uh, connect with people on a human level uh, before you have a nuanced policy conversation. And so in a social media world, I think that's even more important, frankly. And I am not going to take the floor anymore, Kate, because I think we have a much more important <laughs> Uh, I see. Question, Eric, you should run for office. We should listen to this woman. <laughs> I hate to interrupt that question. It was so important, but I see that our honored guest has arrived tonight. Um, we are profoundly grateful to her for her support. She has been a huge champion for ARENA every step of the way, and she has modeled the spirit of public service that we so desperately seek in the next generation of leadership. I am so excited to welcome Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton to the call. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Kate. And it is such a great pleasure for, for me to be part of this uh, arena gathering. And to you and Ravi and Swati and Adisu and everyone who's part of it, thank you. Thank you in the midst of this terrible pandemic uh, where we're dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with all of the challenges this crisis presents. We're thinking about the future. Uh, for being ready to throw yourself into the arena, to run for office, to support people who are running for office, to help them uh, get ready and trained, to raise money, to manage campaigns, to do everything we need you to do. Uh, because I don't think I have to stress after you've had your conversation and that you're already committed uh, to the arena and its uh, mission, uh, that we could not have uh, a more important election than the one coming up this November. And it's not only at the top, of course, we have to do everything we can to uh, retire the current incumbent in the White House, uh, but it goes all the way down the ballot. It goes to city councils and county commissions and school boards and state legislatures and governor's office and statewide offices uh, in every respect because we've got to claim the future that we want. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that more people are now paying attention to the importance of good governing, uh, to tackling the uh, justice uh, problems we face, the economic inequities, the health inequities that stalk our country. Uh, if anyone could have ignored it or tried to uh, just put uh, your head in the sand and hope it went away, you can't anymore. Uh, we're looking at frontline workers who are often not paid minimum wage, who were not given uh, protective uh, gear in order to keep serving us. Uh, we know our frontline workers, both in our healthcare system and in every other area of our lives together, uh, deserve the kind of future that you're working toward and the candidates that you are and that you're supporting will help us uh, bring to fruition. I'm so proud of Arena. I remember incredibly well my very first conversation uh, with Ravi. You had this crazy idea about trying to uh, create uh, a venue, uh, a wonderful opportunity, a network for people uh, to be persuaded, convinced, urged uh, to run for office uh, for a new generation of leadership. And I'm incredibly grateful that the arena is one of the partners that we have in our uh, group Onward Together, which supports dynamic entrepreneurial organizations like the arena uh, that stand on the front lines of trying to change our politics. And that's really what this is about. Uh, we've got to bring about profound change. We have to have a commitment to helping uh, to rebuild better after this pandemic uh, finally is tamed. We have to retire those who are the naysayers and the negative uh, forces in politics who don't believe in our American values, who don't want to give more opportunity to each and every person. So each of you already knows this. Um, you're part of this movement and you have to be committed to seeing it through not only through November, when I hope if we do our work, uh, we not only take back the White House and the Senate and keep the House, 
but we flip state legislatures and governor's offices and so many other important positions so that we'll have a wave, a wave of people working together who understand what's at stake and how we have to change our future. It's up to us. There isn't anybody waiting in the wings. We have to do this. So thank you for being part of the arena. And before I sign off, I, I have my own intelligence sources. Unlike the current incumbent in the White House, I actually pay attention to intelligence. And I have learned that it's um, somebody's birthday today. And I think yeah, I think it's Robbie's birthday. Um, so I won't sing, thank you very much. Uh, but I do want to wish this remarkable young man a very happy birthday. Uh, he has given every ounce of his energy to uh, helping to found the arena, to helping to make it the success that it is with all of you. Uh, so happy birthday, Robbie. But, uh, you know, maybe have fun tonight wherever you're quarantined. And then get back to work making sure that we win elections because we have to win in order to govern. And we have to govern in order to create the future we deserve to have. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you so much, Secretary Clinton. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. And I'm sure we all echo your birthday wishes for our friend, Robbie. Thank um, you. <laughs> before we uh, before we close tonight, I also wanted to just make sure that everyone on the call um, understands how they can get involved in the work that we are doing at Arena. Um, so there are three things that I want to make sure everybody knows before we um, hang up tonight. The first is if you are someone who is looking for your next gig in politics, if you want to work on Democratic campaigns, or if you're someone who's hiring on a Democratic campaign, please do let us know. Um, I think, I don't know if we have a slide to pop up, but Arena Careers, there we go. Um, Arena Careers is uh, that sort of LinkedIn for politics that Robbie mentioned earlier tonight. We want you to get on, create a profile and connect with others in the space. Um, building that enduring pipeline is a huge part of our work. And as Robbie mentioned, is not only important to our short-term success in 2020, but for elections beyond that to come. Um, the second is if you're working on a campaign and you had questions like the ones we heard for Adisu about how to run a campaign in the midst of everything that's going on in the world, or you're just looking for resources on the basics, the fundamentals, how to write a campaign plan, how to think about your mail program or your digital program or your fundraising program, um, please do visit the Arena Toolbox. That is at arena.run backslash toolbox. Um, and finally, um, if you're not working on a campaign and you don't plan to join one, but you wanna support this work, um, we run as a people powered movement and we can only do it with your help please share our messages on social media. And if you're so inclined as to donate, um, this is a, an organization that runs on grassroots donations um, and every single donation counts. So um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, it is our privilege to be in this community with you and we are thinking of you and sending you well wishes. Thanks everybody.